We're back with another YouTube video today. Ooh, yesterday we talked about laying the foundation of the pattern of sevens. Now we're going to talk about the second gift. The second gift. There is another gift in addition to salvation. This is the second pillar of wisdom we are to build upon. We need to receive the Holy Spirit because he is the part of the God. Okay, we need to receive the Holy Spirit because he is part of the Godhead who brings revelation knowledge to us and helps us to know the truth. So the Holy Spirit is God who brings revelation knowledge to you and helps you to know the truth. Jesus said this, John chapter 16, verse 13, John 16, 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. All that can be written about the Holy Spirit cannot truly express what a wonderful God he is. He comes as the identity of Jesus and the Father who is in heaven. So he comes as the identity of Jesus, the Father who is in heaven and imparts his love to us always understanding always com comforting and always searching our hearts to guide and assist us he is a wonderful partner to have on your side the spirit of god who will keep us in truth and show us things to come Who would not want to know the things that are to come? People are always seeking to know about their futures, and some even go to witches, palm readers, who have familiar spirits to seek truth and direction. But our wonderful Lord has the accurate knowledge. Picture the omnipotent one, the omniscient one who knows and sees all. He is the one who knows and who can lead us into the real truth. Therefore, though our sins are forgiven after repenting and being baptized unto Christ, there is still more, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who will open your eyes to the scriptures and impart wisdom to help you in all areas of life. When he, the Holy Spirit, came on the day of Pentecost, the Jews out of every nation heard them speak in their own languages. These devout men may have been sanctimoniously devout, but they were not born again. Though many were pricked in their hearts and repented, others were in disbelief, saying those who had received the Spirit were filled with wine. Their response to this phenomenon bordered mockery. However, the earth was flooded from above with God's love that day. Second day of creation. The Lord began to reveal the meaning of day two to me immediately after he had shown me the meaning of the first day. In Genesis chapter 1, 6 through 8, here is the creation account of day two. Number six, uh, Genesis chapter one, verses six through eight. Here is the creation account of day two. So we're looking at Genesis chapter one, verse six through eight. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. 
just as God is in heaven above and we are in earth below, so is God's spirit, separate from men's spirits. However, the Lord told me that the firmament he created in the midst of the waters represented our minds. You see, God truly desires to send us his spirit, but there is a blockage, it seems. Our minds are the part of us that divide or separate our thoughts that come from above, the thoughts that come from above, which are God's thoughts, from our own human thoughts below. Now, the spirit is represented by water, as seen in the first day of creation. Therefore, this firmament or heavenly part of us that rules our being must be renewed by the word of God. When we learn to think like God, God's spirit will freely join and mingle with our spirit man, becoming one with us. God has given humans a free will, and that will or mindset resides in the area of our souls, our heavenly part, the highest or the top part of our bodies. Through the mind, though the mind will take years to be renewed, God has sent us another comforter, a helper, his Holy Spirit. When we believe that Jesus died for us and was raised from the dead, we receive him, and though we would desire to comfort us, he is not ready to, readily available on the earth, but is seated in heaven with God the Father. Jesus is the Father. The Father is Jesus. This is why he sent another comforter, the Holy Spirit. He sent himself to come back in spirit form so we could communicate with him and receive comfort from him as the Holy Spirit does not speak of himself. But what the Father through the Son say is what he tells us. Now the Holy Spirit is our interpreter to communicate with heaven as he tells the Father through the Son what we are saying when we speak in tongues and then he will also speak unto us. While the Lord was showing me day two, the power of God was so present with me, it was almost overwhelming. My mind was stretched at the awesomeness of what God was revealing, so much so that I asked him to stop. Now, I did not really want him to go away. I just wanted him to wait so I could meditate and reflect on what he had just shown me. See, I was almost afraid I would forget. But now I realize when the Lord talks to you, it is burned into your memories. It's like fire shut up in your bones. You will not forget. You will not forget. However, the Lord did not show me anything more that day. And the rest of the meaning of the seven days of creation took a little bit of time of prayer for the symbolic interpretation to actually be unlocked. It took a lot longer than what it should have. Unlocking the interpretation. One night while sharing these troops with a friend, actually a couple of friends, I remember saying this, if God showed me the representation of the first day meant salvation, and he showed me the second day represented the mind and a person's ability to hear the voice of God, then the rest of the days of creation must have spiritual meaning also. If I had not interrupted the Holy Spirit, he would have shown me all of the representation of the days of creation right then. However, I could now see that this pattern went on, and I could tell where it was going, because everyone knows the meaning and representation of the seventh day is rest. Concerning this rest on the seventh day, let us read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 10. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 4 and in verses 8 through 10. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verses 1 through 4 and in 8 through 10. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into God's rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, 
if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There, there, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11 says, Let us labor, therefore, or let us labor, let us work, therefore, to enter into that rest. Labor, work, strive, therefore, to enter into that rest. Before we enter day seven, which is our resting place, there are six previous areas or days that we have to walk through and mature in. The seven days of creation are the foundational keys to understanding our spiritual development and progression in God. Though many times Christians teach and preach using patterns of seven, most have been oblivious to the meaning of their divine order or the progressive symbolism contained therein. This pattern is the key that will unlock many other spiritual mysteries in God's word. But before we go forward, we need to lay a foundation in the seven days of our personal creation because this is the pattern or order the Lord will use to perfect our spiritual walk. Natural and spiritual growth. Psychological, psycholo, excuse me, psychologists <laughs> have divided man's life into seven notable and distinct levels of natural maturation, outlining the differences of stages of growth from birth until death. Though there is a great difference between babies and the elderly, we are still the same person throughout our entire lifespan. In the same manner, the Lord has given us his seven distinct spirits to guide us through to Christian maturity. He is not seven gods, yet we can see seven sides of his personality, just as mothers and fathers interact with their children on the age level of their individual children, the Lord will accentuate and will magnify specific areas of his godly nature one stage at a time, allowing us to interact with him in a progressive fashion. He wants us to conform to his image one step at a time. This exemplification of seven is also seen as the seven spirits of God preside over the seven churches described in Revelations chapter 1, verse 4. Each of these churches depicts a different level of spiritual growth from 1 through 7 in perfect sequential order, graduating the body of Christ into spiritual maturity. Let us consider the spiritual growth of each. Spiritual phases, infants and toddlers, to the infants in Christ, God is merely a person there for provision. They have a need. They cry and expect the need to be instantly met, and God does. For the spiritual toddlers, there are many tumbles and there are many bruises as they stumble through with much inexperience. The Lord has been there only one step in front of them to catch them if they fall. Sometimes I believe he may be allowing them to mess up a little so they may realize their limited human ability and to learn to call upon the Lord for strength. Youths and teenagers. The youths have learned the word and know the language, but think they are a little more capable than they actually are. The spiritual teenagers have created their own concepts and ideas based on all they have learned and been shown and are very sure they have all sufficiently intact. However, their immaturity is amalgamated by the amount of energy they put into themselves. Young Adults and Adults The young adults have gone through some testing and tribulation. 
and trials and have worked through some issues in their flesh. Though they are still a bit overconfident in ability, there is not too much else out there for them to learn. They have heard it all, so they think. Uh, this is the stage when most go into full-time ministry. While the real maturity, the adults, are already in ministry, they are concerned about others and can hear the voice of the Lord, but are sometimes still ruling with their minds and not yielding to that small, still voice. Their weakness is taking up too many cares of this world, yet they realize that they still have room to expand in their relationship with the Lord and they will get there. True maturity. The older adult has learned to exercise his or her senses. He or she is able to discern both good and evil and is not selfish. He or she demonstrates maturity by yielding the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, kindness, and temperance and is always praying to reach another area of perfection in his or her walk with God. Few people have reached this stage of maturity. Many called few chosen, but it is God's will for us to reach this level. Therefore, as we are all on different levels of understanding concerning spiritual matters, we must conclude that as we mature, our view of God and our understanding of God's word is going to change. Thus, this growth will cause some disputation of interpretation and views between followers of Christ. This should not be cause for alarm if we could see through spiritual eyes the difference in spiritual ages. We would not be amazed by vast differences of opinion. Are we surprised when a five-year-old does not understand why mom or dad has to go to work or why they cannot live at the beach? They have a very narrow view of what is involved in life. It is no different when dealing with spiritual matters. Therefore, I have attempted to create a brief illustration on how a person's relationship with their Heavenly Father, I mean, uh, I have attempted to create a brief illustration on how a person's relationship with their father and mother might change as that individual grows up and matures. Note, Though the parents may change somewhat, the child is changing much more rapidly. You see, God never changes, but will come to you in different ways during the different days of your spiritual maturity. And he treats us exactly the same throughout each day. A mini parable. Once there was a baby born, a baby boy that was born to a happily wedded man and woman. As an infant, the mother was the baby's source of comfort and always provided his nourishment. If there was any hunger pain, he cried out, and her figure would appear over him, cradle him, and fix his discomfort. Yet as he grew older, his demands were not always met as quickly, so the times the mother would appear when he called began to be somewhat less urgent. Several months later, the toddler began to interact more with his dad. His relationship with his parents became more involved as his personality began to mature. Moreover, the sounds he had been hearing were now associated with events, and he was beginning to understand language. His parents began to ignore his grunts and compelled him to use the words they knew he could say. He could no longer just scream out for attention. A couple of more years, and this little boy realized that his mother was not always comfort. Sometimes she was correction. He could now walk and talk and was learning to do much for himself. However, there seemed to be so many things he was not doing right. What had been bliss was now a whole lot of correction and training. However, the mother was a patient teacher and over time taught him to play the piano. After a few years had passed, the boy went to school, and after school, his dad would play catch with him. Later, he coached him in baseball and became quite good at the game. The boy was becoming a well-rounded and responsible young man. In the meantime, there were greater privileges and deeper conversations with greater expectations 
from both sides of the relationship. His parents were requiring more of him, but he was also allowed greater freedom and the gifts he received were becoming more expensive or valuable. As he became a young adult, he finished school and desired to learn a trade to earn his own money. However, his father had a business and asked him if he would consider working for him. Therefore, he began to work at his family's business and became employed by his father. Now, the role of the parents to this child could be indicative of the spiritual growth of God's children. Even in this simple parable, we can clearly see why all view God and the Bible so differently at times and have so many dissenting opinions. Though there may be Though there may be overlapping areas in this illustration, my point is this. The boy's view of his parents changed as he grew, and so it'll be with one's Christian life. As you grow in God, your understanding of spiritual truths will shift, and your personality and calling will sometimes change. However, this is how the Holy Spirit works with us to raise us up spiritually. God does not change. We do. And God works with us. As the boy grew and the parable developed, the roles of his parents changed. At first, the mother was a comfort to the child, but then she also became one who brought correction. Next, she became his teacher. The father also was a loving father who corrected his son when he needed it. He began to play ball with his child as a game of catch, but later began to coach him more seriously in the game. So at times he was a pal, and at other times a teacher or coach. Later in life, the father hired him to work for him and became his employer. Subsequently, the illustration aligns with truth concerning our relationship with the Lord. As we desire to fulfill the call of God on our lives, our relationship with the Lord becomes more than baby type. No pain, give me immediately all I ask for, crying out like a baby, wah, wah, kind of relationship. And it becomes more than a legalistic work ethic relationship. Our relationship with our Heavenly Father becomes one like that of a father-son relationship loaded with benefits as we choose to labor for him. Now the son who works for his father, does he not have a father any longer if his father becomes his employer? No, he now has a father and an employer. They are one. Did the young boy lose his mother when she became his teacher? No, she can be both a mother and a teacher. So why is it that when we get a new revelation in God, we seem to want to throw the old one away? Why do people think that there is only one interpretation to the word of God? Are we preaching another gospel? No. When we begin to see these deeper truths in God's word, these greater truths, these deeper truths in God's word, when you begin to see these deeper truths in God's word, you cannot, and I mean you cannot throw away the first level of understanding. When you get to deeper levels of understanding, these deeper truths in God's word, you cannot throw away the first level of understanding. But you must build upon them, layer upon layer. In our beginning with the Lord, these simple truths were the only support and the only truths you knew. No matter how simple those truths seem to us now, in our beginning, that was our solid rock, Christ. And even the simplest truths are still the truth and don't despise small beginnings and don't throw away the basic simple truths that you first learned. Just because you're entering now into a more progressive state of revelation. And experiencing deeper truths. Deeper understanding 
don't throw away the foundation that was laid before it. So no matter how simple those truths seem to you now, in our beginning, that was our solid rock, Christ. And even the simplest truths are still the truth. Therefore, as children grow up, let us allow others to grow up in the Lord. We do not want to drown them with deeper revelation before they are able to spiritually receive it. But at the same time, the word of God has to be built upon, line upon line, beginning with the foundation first. And they have to be winged from the milk and drawn from the breast and caused to be able to drink wine and eat strong meat and drink some wine and eat some meat and then come up to the strongest of all wine, the strongest of all meat, which is symbolically representative of the revelations of God's word. The word of God is likened unto milk, the baby, spiritual baby food, and then learning how to eat, being winged from the milk, being drawn from the breast, no longer a baby, now you're learning to eat some solid food. Uh, you know, eat a little meat, drink a little wine, but it's not the most solid of all. It's not the most uh, deepest of all. But at least now you're coming off of the baby food and learning how to eat some solid food. That's what the Bible tells us. And those believers and those churches and families that never come off the spiritual baby food, they're going to be spiritually deformed, not truly saved, not truly born again. I mean, they are on God's end of the deal, but they won't be able to receive it. They won't be able to experience and walk in the light of it, let alone the, all the way up to full salvation. You know, because they just stuck on the spiritual baby food, unskillful in the works of righteousness. And unskillful in the works of righteousness. That, 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 that is not God's will for us. But we all come through that door as a babe in Christ. But we must come to full maturity. We must get off the baby food and learn how to eat and drink some uh, solid food and drink some solid drink. And then go on to full maturity. The, the, the more sure word of prophecy whereby you will do exceptionally well to take heed. The strongest of the meat, the strongest of the wine. Therefore, as children grow up, let us allow others to grow up in the Lord. We do not want to drown them with deeper revelation before they are able to receive it. But at the same time, the word of God has to be built upon line upon line beginning with the foundation first, and it must be winged from the milk and drawn from the breast and caused or made to, to start eating solid food. Now, we do not want to drown them with deeper revelation before they are able to receive it, but the word of God has to be built upon line upon line, beginning with the foundation first, and they have to come off of baby food sooner or later or they will be spiritually deformed, not truly saved as far as their experience goes and, and, and all the blessings and, and, and prosperity, heavenly and, and earthly, of, uh, uh, of experiencing it. They, they, they won't be able to. And like Jesus said, he deposited his life into people, his light, his salvation, and the person that did not grow and mature and continue to grow and mature until they reach full maturity, what he had was taken away from them and given to those that had more. The book of Revelation clearly gives us the implication that names that have been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life can be blotted out. You can lose the experience of your salvation, and therefore you're no longer experiencing it. And if you die without getting back into experiencing it, then you'll have to go to hell's bells. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. If you don't believe me, look into the Bible. 
Because I know the gospel don't give a damn if you don't believe what I'm saying. I don't give a damn if you don't believe what I'm saying. I, I, in the name of Jesus, I'm trying to help y'all. Because I know I'm talking to some of y'all. Your name can be blotted out. You can lose your salvation. Salvation and, and salvation is progressive. Experiencing God's salvation is progressive. And it's based upon the knowledge of him that's called us unto glory. And we have to progressively be going up into greater truths, greater revelation. Concerning the entire written word of God, greater revelation. So you're, you can lose your salvation. You can wind up in hell if you're not careful to do everything that the Bible says to make sure that don't happen. You know, but we need to experience salvation. So many people believe they're saved, but they really are not experiencing it. You can truly believe you're saved all you want, but if you never really experience it, it's just a wind of doctrine. Uh, so if you never experience it, then you're not saved. You know, what God did for you is a was a waste of time because you, you know, on your part, because you didn't adhere to God when he said, obey my word. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and experience the salvation, experience the doctrine. Don't just store up a bunch of revelation knowledge in your heart and head. You got to get to doing it, obeying it, experiencing it. So we do not want to drown people with deeper revelation before they are able to receive it. But the word of God has to be built upon line upon line, beginning with the foundation first. Once the Lord showed me a vision that pertained to a man in the congregation where we were worshiping, and I saw that this man had built a house. But then I noticed that the foundation to the house was sitting next to the house, off to the side next to the house. And I realized that his house had no foundation or floor because it was off to the side. The Lord was showing me through this vision what sometimes happens to people who are diving into the deeper things of God, but are disregarding their foundation. When someone has a foundation in Christ, that person should never leave their foundation when going on into the deeper truths, but build upon it because the foundation has to be connected with the rest of the building, otherwise it'll crumble even if it is true. Uh, Jesus is that foundation, the one on which we are to build. His words to us are those first testimonies, the rudiments of our faith and our foundation, the small beginnings, the milk of God's word. Not only will we build upon these first experiences in God, but one day we may need to pull up those testimonies, those first experiences, those small beginnings in God as aids, as helps to be able to share our beginnings with others who are new in the faith. Therefore, do not throw away those first revelations given to you by the Lord, but allow him to build on them. There are spiritual interpretations and deeper revelations in God's word. The truth of God's word is literal as well as spiritual. The truth of God's word is literal as well as spiritual, and it is also highly symbolic. This leaves a lot of room for much revelation knowledge to abound in the diversity of God's people. However, God's word began by the writing of the law, which was literal and pragmatic in nature. The symbolic shadows and types had not been revealed to us in the Old Testament, yet Jesus did not come to take away the law, but to fulfill it, to build on it. Matthew 5, 17. If you attempt to push people into the deeper spiritual waters, 
too quickly, they may drown. So let us be careful that we do not offend one of his little ones. Only help them build a strong foundation on the rock before the storm comes. The uniqueness of day two. There are three reasons why I put so much emphasis on being baptized in the Holy Spirit. First, receiving the baptism completely changed my life and brought me into a closer relationship with my Lord. It gave me much joy and victory over sin, and it allowed me to receive revelation knowledge from God, such as that which you are reading in this book. Secondly, I want to share this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit with everyone else who wants a deeper revelation and relationship with God. So like I said, there are three reasons why I put so much emphasis on being baptized in the Holy Ghost. First, receiving the baptism completely changed my life and brought me into a closer relationship with my Lord. It gave me much joy and victory over sin, and it allowed me to receive revelation knowledge from God, such as that which you are reading in this book. Secondly, I want to share this, you know, wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost with everyone else who wants a deeper relationship with God. Plus, I believe that it is my commission to give others what I have received from him. As he said, freely you have received, now freely give. Thirdly, I know that without, without going into day two and being completely immersed in God's spirit, you cannot continue to progress into further spiritual development. Say that again. I know that without going into day two and being completely immersed in God's spirit, you cannot continue to progress into further spiritual development. Therefore, that person or church will not only not enter God's rest, they will not attain to the calling God has placed inside of them, individual or corporate. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not initiated by men. Even very spiritual people cannot get others filled with the Holy Spirit just because they may want them to have the gift. God knows the hearts of men and who is ready to receive, just like salvation. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is given to us by grace, not because we are especially good people or have suffered tremendously or done any mighty work or deed. The only requirement is that one must desire, one must want to serve the Lord with all of his or her heart. God is not mocked, and just as John the Baptist warned some of the Pharisees to go and do works meet suitable for repentance, knowing they were not ready to fully give their hearts to the Lord. So the Lord knows those who are serious about serving him. He will not give his spirit to just anyone, but only to those who want to wholly dedicate their lives to him. He gives his spirit to the obedient Christians, not the disobedient ones, not the foolish. Now, if you are truly seeking, really and truly, genuinely seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit and have not received yet, do not condemn yourself and do not blame God, but continue to seek God. Sometimes, even if someone really loves the Lord, that person will need guidance in procuring faith. My testimony is a good example. When I was receiving the baptism, I was doing something wrong that blocked the Holy Spirit from filling me at first. I was in doubt that I would receive. Remember, our minds 
Your mind has to be in agreement with God's word. You must, without a doubt, you must, without a shadow of a doubt, believe you are going to receive. If you have doubt, you are not in faith. And without faith, you cannot please God. You must think like God or the spirit above will not be able to get through your mind to feel your spirit below. You must think like God or the spirit above will not be able to get through your mind to feel your spirit below. No one is good except God. So we must trust in God's righteousness, the righteousness of Christ and not your own. Yet the Lord will wash your sins away and liberally or liberally wants to give us his spirit. The Lord will wash away all of your sins and liberally wants to give you his spirit to those who obey. However, before taking that second step, before taking that second step, you need to be secure, rooted and grounded in your salvation, your beginnings with God. Uh, you should be looking to please the Lord with a truly looking to please the Lord with a closer, more intimate relationship and continue growing fuller in dedication and service for him. The principal thing the Holy Spirit does for us in day two is help us discern good from evil. He helps us renew our minds. The firmament part of our being that has the potential to cut off God's voice from our spirit man. When the days of creation are aligned, it is obvious that the second day of creation is different. The Lord told me that the firmament created on day two represents our mind. Now our minds are not good, though they do get much better after you receive salvation and you become a new creature in Christ, but you're not fully saved yet. You're not fully mature. You haven't fully grown up into Christ in all things yet. You're just a little baby, unskillful in the works of righteousness. Don't know how to live by faith. You don't know how to walk by faith. You don't know how to be born again. And if you never change and you stay a spiritual baby all your life, then you will not be saved. But the principal thing the Holy Spirit does for us in day two is to help us discern good from evil. He helps us renew our minds, the firmament part of our being that has the potential to cut off God's voice from our spirit man. So the principal thing the Holy Spirit does for us in day two is help us discern good from evil. He helps us renew our minds, the firmament part of our being that has the potential to cut off God's voice from our spirit man. When the days of creation are aligned, it is obvious that the second day of creation is different. The Lord told me that the firmament created on day two represents our mind. Our minds are not good, though they do get much better after we receive salvation. Renewing the mind will be a lifetime process. Not until day six will a person even begin to think as God would have, have them to think. This is because your spirituality is not a mental exercise that comes from a human source. Spiritual growth takes place. Spiritual growth takes place as a person learns the word of God. Spiritual growth takes place as you learn the word of God. 
and put it into practice in your life. So spiritual growth takes place as a person learns the Word of God and puts the Word of God into practice in their life. The Holy Spirit helps us in hearing God's voice and then being obedient to Him. This is the Spirit-led life. Salvation is a free gift, yes. But if salvation was a tree, God would not at first give you a tree bearing fruit, but a seed. You must grow in God and continue to grow in God by first renewing your minds and then continuing to renew your minds. When you were first born again, become a baby in Christ, a new creature, God cleansed your spirit and forgave you your sins. But your mind is not yet good. Your mind is not yet saved. It's not yet born again. It, your mind is not experiencing it yet. Your mind must be renewed and reprogrammed by learning God's words and meditating on God's thoughts. When we think like God, when you think like God, meditating on God's words, you will allow the Holy Spirit to flow into your spirit. I see your mind working as a network or maze of tiny pipelines, allowing water to either flow through or be shut off, determined by right or wrong thoughts. Some areas of our minds are blocked by previous programming that has deceived and caused the flow of God's Spirit to be deviated or have to go around or be detoured around our carnal thoughts. This is an example of what happens when a person is in unbelief. There is a reason people do not believe God, and it is usually because they have formally believed a lie. Now, the flow from heaven cannot enter properly and is being repelled by a blockage of incorrect thinking. Conclusively, that blockage in its entirety represents the thoughts of the old carnal nature that reside from your formal or former uh, uh, sinful lifestyles. Yet if you could clean out those old thoughts by spending time before the presence of the Lord, looking into God's word and searching out God's ways, then you could allow the spiritual waters from above to flow through your firmament, your mind, and water your human spirit below. Comparing the days of creation. Let us align the days below and observe the difference between day two, which represents the renewal of the mind in comparison to the other days. The uh, third epistle of John, John 3, the third epistle of John, that would be 3 John in verse 2, 3 John verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospereth. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotion. Now notice that anything you could prosper in, even your health, is all conditional upon the measure in which your souls prosper. Now, your soul will prosper according to the measure of godly thoughts you possess. Your soul, that is mind, will, and emotion, will prosper according to to the measure of godly thoughts you possess. So if you don't possess an abundance of godly thoughts, your mind, will, and emotions will not be prospering much. Your soul, your mind, your will, your emotion will prosper according 
to the measure of godly thoughts you possess. The measure of the word of God you have deposited in your heart. This is why God did not call his work on the second day good. See, when we are first saved or born again, our minds are not filled with the knowledge of God. We become, we become a new creature in Christ, and that creature needs to grow up to full maturity. Salvation is not just a free ticket to stay on this earth after the tribulation in the presence of God forever and not get booted out. Salvation is becoming a new creature in Christ, and that person, that creature in Christ, must is born from above and must grow up into full maturity just as we naturally did. So when you are first saved or born again, you become a new creature in Christ and you must come and, and grow and mature until you reach full maturity. Well, your mind is not filled with the knowledge of God. When we are first saved or born again, our minds are not filled with the knowledge of God but they must be renewed by God's word. So this area of our development is represented by the creation of day two. Now we can see below that the Lord did not confirm his work on this second day as being good because it was not a complete work. You see, for many cinephists, here is what we have when we align the Genesis days of creation. Here's what we have when we begin to align the, the Genesis days of creation. Day one, Genesis chapter one, verse four. And God saw the light that it was good. Day one, Genesis chapter one, verse four. And God saw the light that it was good. Then we have day two. And God didn't say anything about, you know, day two being good. It's blank. Then we have day three. Day three, Genesis chapter one, verse 10. And God saw that it was good. Again on day three, Genesis chapter one, verse 11. And God saw that it was good. Day four, Genesis chapter one, verse 18. And God saw that it was good. Day five, Genesis chapter one, verse 21. And God saw that it was good. Day six, Genesis chapter one, verse 25. And God saw that it was good. Day six, Genesis chapter one, verse 31. Again on day six, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. There is no mistake here. Every day, the Lord called his work good. Every day, the Lord called his work good, except for day two. Every day, the Lord called his work good, except for day two. Day two is left blank. Why? Because God said nothing regarding the creation of this day. Why? Because the renewing of your mind, the renewing of our minds, is not a work of grace. It doesn't happen automatically, but it involves the free will and choice of a man or woman or child to believe and think as he or she chooses. This is why God could not bless the firmament, which represents the mind. He created on day two. He knew our minds would be an unfinished work contingent upon the faithfulness and diligence of those who choose to learn and follow his words, just as a child learns to walk. We must also learn to walk in faith. We must learn to believe God and what God has said rather than be moved by our circumstances. Have faith in God.
Faith begins by believing in God's word. Faith begins by believing in God's word. The word of God created everything that is. And all that you can see and, and the powers that you cannot see, he created everything in order by sequential days and, and he spoke it into existence. His words, God's words, have creative force. And when any of your thoughts fully align with God's thoughts, God's power is available to you concerning that matter. The problem is this. People have faith in certain areas of their lives and yet lack faith in other areas because they only partly know the word of God. And so they're hindered for lack of knowledge. Or as the Bible says, destroyed for lack of knowledge spiritually or even physically uh, just as we are growing in the Lord just as you are growing in the Lord your faith is also growing uh, therefore your maturity has a lot to do with your level of faith faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God Romans 10 17 so when your mind is renewed by God's words, then your thoughts become as God's thoughts. Your natural thoughts may touch God's thoughts or even overlap somewhat. But when you are in perfect alignment, you are in perfect agreement and fullness of faith. This is what it means to believe with your whole heart and doubt not. As we progress through the seven days, your mind is open more and more like a valve opening to allow God's Spirit to flow into you from heaven. When you actually enter God's rest, the valve is fully turned on. Now this turning begins when you begin to hold fast to the profession of your faith without wavering. Every time you confess God's word, you are opening the valve a little more and becoming a little more perfectly aligned with God's will. Having a lack of belief in God and, and, and walking in little faith Having a lack of belief in God and walking in little faith has been the main hindering force that has stopped God's miracle working power from being in our church services and our personal lives today. We are supposed to be God's children, but are all stopped up, all seem to be stopped up with your own thoughts and mindsets, and God has little room in your life. He has little room in the end. Little room in your life. People spend more time watching TV than they do seeking God and receiving revelation. Shut off the TV, folks. And get back to, to fasting and prayer. Praise and worship. And, and the reading, studying, and meditating of the Word of God. Our heavenly parts are hindered and clogged with too many emotional memories and fleshly experiences, the cares of earthly matters, condemnation, and unbelief of various degrees. The Holy Bible and godly principles, the Holy Bible and godly principles are the very foundation for having faith, and all who seek peace and desire a prosperous life will renew their mind by God's word. Hopefully, you have put vile and wicked thoughts behind you. Illicit and lustful thoughts definitely have no place in a Christian's life. Neither does anger, resentment, bitterness, or evil thinking of others. Wrongful judgment, greed, or the love of money, and other works of the flesh. But I know there's many Christians that are still in a baby stage and they haven't really come out of Adam, and they don't even, doesn't look like anything changed. 
each needs to fill in his or her own blanks and, you know, begin to renew those wrong thoughts with God's word and learn to believe God's word above and beyond the report of a bank statement, above and beyond the report of a doctor, above and beyond the report of bad weather. Though in experience, though in experience in spiritual matters is an open door for the devil to come in and play, bringing havoc into your lives. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, We must learn to cast our cares upon the Lord, for he cares for us. And your teacher is the Holy Ghost. So you got to have Pentecost. The Holy Spirit will help us do this. Chapter 3. You know, in a message that, that I had wrote one time, was talking about Pentecost and talking about the need to be filled with the Spirit. But we must learn to cast our cares upon the Lord, for He cares for us. First, First Peter 5, 7. And the Holy Spirit is the teacher that is going to teach you how to do that. The Holy Spirit will help you do this. Now, going forth from day one, going forth from day one, this is a day one type experience when someone initially comes to Jesus then very soon after that person should be baptized in water for the remission of his or her sins yet John the Baptist pointed to Jesus who promised a second experience John the Baptist said I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Matthew 3.11 When we receive this second baptism, when you receive this second baptism, this baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, you begin to go forward from the first day of your salvation to enter the next phase of your walk with God, day two. Now, John the Baptist could not give us this spiritual baptism, but could only give you a baptism of repentance, the water baptism associated with day one. Now, this water baptism was a precursor or symbol of the Holy Spirit, which was to come in day two. Yet, you will need to have a baptism of power. You will need to have a baptism of power to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. And to be able to walk in the Spirit, to continue to abide in Him. You know, we all need more of God. We all need to keep ourselves filled to overflowing. During John's life, he could not give us this kind of baptism. However, he never neglected to preach the doctrine about it, pointing to Jesus and declaring that he would be the one to actually bring you this baptism of power. Consider these words by John the Baptist that are recorded in each of the Gospels. Each one reads only slightly different from one another. They all refer to the same thing. First, we have Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Mark chapter 1, verse 7 and 8 says, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. Indeed, I have baptized you with water, but he, Jesus, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Then we have Luke chapter 3, 16 and 17. Luke chapter 3, 16 and 17 says, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, 
and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the shaft he will burn with fire unquenchable. Then we have John chapter 1, 26 to 27. John 1, 26 to 27 says, But there standeth one among you, whom you know not. Verse 27, He it is, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose shoes latched I'm not worthy to unloose. Then we have John 1.33. John 1.33 says, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptized it with the Holy Ghost. There are These are the quotations of John. However, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened until it be accomplished? Well, in John chapter 7, uh, 38 to 39, John 7, 38 to 39, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. This verse indicates that a further work would be given to us after the glorification or resurrection of Jesus. In addition, Jesus was present with his disciples in the first chapter of Acts, and he told them, Acts chapter 1, verses 5, and also chapter 8, verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Uh, these were the very words that had been spoken and carried out by John the Baptist. Again, these were the very words that had been spoken and carried out by John the Baptist. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Two baptisms. Two baptisms. The verses above speak of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that became available to everyone through Christ after Pentecost. The verses above speak of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that became available to believers through Christ after Pentecost. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 specifically says that you would receive power if you think that you have the Holy Spirit. If you truly think that you have the Holy Spirit, then what measure of power do you actually have? If you think that you have the Holy Spirit, what measure of power do you have? Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in you. If you shake in your boots, if you shake in your boots when you have to testify of the Lord, if you shake in your boots when you have to testify of the Lord and you're shy and timid, I think you might need more power. God gave the disciples power to proclaim his gospel to the world and to do signs and wonders that others might believe. His power is still available to us today. And it is especially important that the church be filled with God's power in this hour because the devil is becoming more and more brazen with his evil works and schemes it will be necessary for us who belong to god to have power to be able to resist the evil that is coming on this earth now we need the help of the holy spirit and it begins with a day two experience in day one we are baptized in water 
which represents the putting away or the burying of the old man. Next, as Christ was raised, so we come up out of those baptismal waters in newness of life with our sins washed away. Now, this event of baptism has two sides. First, he took our sins, and therefore we should repent of our sins. Second, he was raised from the dead, therefore we should seek to be righteous and please him as we are now alive unto God. Now, 1 Peter First Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. When you go under the water in baptism, when you go under the water in baptism, you are symbolically buried with Christ. And when you are lifted up from being under the water, you are given new life as your Lord was also raised from the dead. Jesus was raised by the power of God and left the sins he took for us in hell. In like manner, we leave our sins behind under that water after being washed clean in baptism. When Christ was resurrected, he changed his garment, and he entered the throne room where he sat at the Father's right hand. Now he has given us access to enter before the throne of the Father and have our prayers heard. Spiritually, we are clothed in white. His righteousness. Spiritually, we are clothed in white. Christ's righteousness. And seated with Christ in heavenly places. And we need to experience that. Wow, well, right now in the presence of our enemies. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. Ephesians chapter 2, 4 through 7 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, verse 5, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, verse 6, and raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. After Jesus rose from the dead, he had a glorified body, and he sat down united in heaven with his other aspect, which is the Father, because Jesus is the Father, and the Father is Jesus. Jesus Christ, according to the book of Revelation, is the one Father that sat on the throne, but he's also revealed as the Son, the only person who was ever worthy enough to open up the book. And it's the same exact person, the same exact entity, Uh, after Jesus rose from the dead, he had a glorified body, and he then sat down, united in heaven, with his other aspect, which is the Father. Then the Father, through the Son, sent the Holy Spirit into this earth. In other words, God sent the Holy Spirit into this earth. He sent himself. God came back. Just as he promised, he said, I'm going to go away, and then I'm coming back. God came back in the form of the Holy Spirit, the true nature of God, invisible spirit form. Okay, so God came back in the form of the Spirit into this earth, so we could be one with him that day on the day of Pentecost. For the first time in the history of mankind, humans were able to become transformed by having the power and nature of God that had come to dwell in them. Their hearts were literally changed when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hear the words of Paul who said, The same Spirit which raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. 
Romans 8, 11. This is why Jesus desires that you be filled with his spirit. It is the same Holy Spirit that gives us life and that raised Christ from the dead that he also wants you to receive. When you do, you will be able to communicate with God by his spirit in you, as previously stated. Water baptism represents your being buried with Christ and being raised again unto life with Christ Jesus. However, again, previous, as previously stated, water baptism represents your being buried with Christ and being raised again unto life with Christ Jesus. However, this is meaning of the first baptism. There are actually seven actual, there are seven actual applications of types of baptism in God's word. Seven actual applications of types of baptism in God's word. And each aligns with the pattern of seven in Genesis. They each build upon the other. Okay, the first day of salvation, day number one, you have water baptism, which is John's baptism. Day number two, you have the Holy Spirit baptism, and that is your second day of salvation. Day three, or the third day of your salvation, you have the baptism into Christ. The fourth day of your salvation, day four, by one spirit you are baptized into one body. The fifth day of salvation, go ye into all the world and baptize. The sixth day of salvation, you have the baptism of the cloud. In the seventh day of salvation, baptism into God's rest. So in the word of God, we have seven types, symbolic types of baptism. The second baptism, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the second baptism, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, builds upon the first, which is the baptism of water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Well, the second baptism, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, builds upon the first, which is baptism of water. Now, we are in Christ, crucified, and then resurrected again with newness of life. You are in Christ, crucified, and then resurrected again with newness of life, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter said this on the day of Pentecost, when those who had heard him preach were pricked in their hearts and asked him what they should do, Acts 2.37. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ only, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2.38. John truly baptized with water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, just as Peter told these people to do. Yet John the Baptist never said, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because the Holy Spirit would not come until that day on Pentecost. John also qualified that the baptism that Jesus would baptize you with would be one of fire and power. Therefore, how much more important it is to be baptized with the baptism that Jesus sent, and not just John's. Remember, when John was baptizing people in water, Jesus had not yet risen from the dead, and therefore he had not yet seen the Holy Spirit into the earth. But when Pentecost came, 50 days after his resurrection, then the Holy Spirit came. He was sent into the earth for the first time to live inside of men. On this side of the cross, after the day of Pentecost, anyone who has been baptized in water should receive 
the second baptism of the Holy Spirit. On this side of the cross, after the day of Pentecost, anyone who has been baptized in water for the remission of their sins should receive the second baptism of the Holy Spirit. For if you have been baptized in water, why not also be baptized with the spiritual waters, which the natural waters represent? Upon entering day two, when a person is baptized in the Spirit, that person will have accessibility to stay in God's presence and feel God's anointing much more often, even though they did intermittently feel God's presence in day one. Though we are saved by grace when you come to the Lord, though you are saved by grace when you come to the Lord, the Holy Spirit is going to help you in cleansing your heart, your mind, your will, your emotion, and to help you live right. The Lord's plan is for you to first repent. First repent, then turn to Christ, receive salvation, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit. So God's plan is for us to first repent, turn to Him, receive salvation, and then be filled with the Holy Ghost. This is the pattern for believers. And in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Holy Ghost shouldn't be called Acts of the Apostles. It should be called the Acts of the Holy Ghost. And in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 37 and 38, the men who heard Peter speak at Pentecost, observing the 120 followers of Christ being filled with the Spirit, they were pricked in their hearts. Now, when they heard this, Peter's preaching, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then in the next verse, verse 38, Peter summarized God's plan for men to receive. He told them what they need to do. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39, For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now the verse above, Acts 2.39, should resolve the question about whether tongues is for today. Now this gift of the Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost did not come for the disciples only, but for all people who would receive Christ. Why else would Peter tell the people that day, the promise is for you and your children and others, all that are afar off, Acts 2.39. This phrase, all that are afar off, is referring to the generations that would come. Your children, their children, and the great-great-grandchildren who are to receive of this same gift, continuing right on up until today when it reaches you and me. Isaiah chapter 28, Isaiah chapter 28, verses 12 to 13, to whom he said, This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. They would not listen. They would not believe. Verse 13, But the word of the Lord was to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. All the people that gathered at Pentecost heard the gospel that day in the tongue or language of their own birth. Though many received, others did not. 3,000 souls received Jesus that day and were baptized, yet some stumbled at that rock of stumbling, Jesus Christ. God's words and thoughts are illustrated as being like water in the form of rain and snow, 
light and heavier anointing. Uh, the Lord is saying, when I send out my anointing, coming like rain or snow from heaven, light or heavy, I am sending it to you, the earth, to cause you to bloom and blossom and bring forth fruit that provides seed, words originating from God or revelation knowledge. When someone blooms or blossoms, that person has hope and joy. They have a countenance that is positive and full of faith, and that kind of an attitude will produce fruit, causing one to work the works of righteousness and become pleasing to God. Those righteous works will then bear witness that God is real because others will be able to see God's blessing and favor in that person's life. The seed someone produces through righteousness will have a twofold purpose. Seeds can be planted or ground into flour to make bread for the hungry. They both indicate that we will have something we can share. By sharing the gospel to the poor or lost, we are planting the seed. When we share revelation truth to other saints, we are feeding them bread. When we receive God's rain and snow from heaven, we will also reap the rest of the promises of that chapter. Isaiah 55 verse 12 says, For you shall go out with joy, and you shall be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. This is real, folks. There is no greater joy than sharing the gospel and imparting real life to others. God's Zoe life. When you find God, all of those mountains and hills in your life that seem so insurmountable and impossible to overcome will become your places of victory, and all that surround them will rejoice with you. These trees of the field, literally, that these trees of the field which clap their hands, literally represent people who will celebrate your victory with you. Then verse 13 says, instead of the thorn, representing that which is painful and irritating, because a thorn is painful and irritating, shall come up the cypress tree, representing words of peace or rest. And instead of the briar, representing weeds or unproductive thoughts, shall come up the myrtle tree, representing sweet productive thoughts. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the promise God gives those who spread his word. His name will never be cut off. Praying in the Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit and begin to pray in your heavenly prayer language, pray in other tongues as the Spirit gives you utterance, thus, or praying in the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord will wash and cleanse your conscience as He reveals His truths to you and puts you in remembrance of His Word. It will be through the Spirit or by the Spirit. You mortify, kill the deeds of the flesh, Romans 8, 13. He will give you his anointing of peace, and he will show you things to come, assisting you in knowing all truth. The presence of the Holy Spirit saturates your heart like the precious rain that comes after a drought. He falls on your parched dry ground, softens your hearts, allowing the harmful weeds to be pulled out as his words are brought forth in our minds. Over time, one will be able to fill his or her mind with enough of God's word to be able to discern right and wrong and be completely led by God's Holy Spirit. Through memorizing verses in the Bible, though memorizing verses in the Bible is a good beginning that should be accompanied by much prayer in the Spirit and reading full chapters. Though memorizing verses in the Bible is a good beginning, that should be accompanied by much prayer in the Spirit. And reading full chapters 
to gain understanding of their true contents. The Holy Spirit will lead you in knowing how to use God's word as a weapon against the devil who would attempt to use your own carnal thoughts and past failures against you. To possess effective authority from God, we must not only learn to confess God's word, but we must spend time praying in other tongues by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that one again. To possess effective authority from God, you must not only learn to confess God's word, but you must also spend time praying in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. To possess effective authority from God, you must not only learn to confess God's word, but you must spend time praying in other tongues by the Holy Spirit. This immediately puts you into God's perfect will. God always knows all things and can help you pray perfectly for these situations that pertain to you. He does not pray for you without involving your will, but searches your hearts and then prays perfectly through you. God helps you pray. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Romans 8, 26-27 Now the Holy Spirit is praying through you. The Holy Spirit is praying through you perfectly with words you could not naturally speak. It is the tongues of angels. Uh, and he knows how you would pray if you had all knowledge of the situation you were praying about, as God does. However, he searches your heart, bypasses your mind, and gets the job done. And everything was set up to where you'd have to depend upon him. Thank goodness God does not have, thank goodness God does not have to tell you first what is going on before he gets you to pray in the spirit about an urgent matter. Many times a situation in your life will need immediate attention in prayer, though you may not even know what it is. Through the Holy Spirit, the Lord gets to the root of the matter quickly and addresses the problem. Even if you do not know there is one, he kindly protects your mind from the horrible outcome and all of the consequences that could have been had the Holy Spirit not been there to help you intervene through prayer. Now, you must be obedient to pray God's word. You must be obedient to pray God's word in your own language of understanding as well as by the Spirit in tongues. You must be obedient to pray God's word in your own language of understanding, as well as by the Spirit in tongues. When you take your life to the Lord, he will intervene for you, and he will cause all things to work together for good. By faith, you can know that with God, all is well taken care of concerning you. As God's children, uh, you should be set free from any encumbrances or plans the devil could conjure up. And though you understand you are no match for the devil in the frailty of your mortal flesh, however, by the Holy Spirit, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, Philippians 4.13. And this is why it is expedient that you pray and fast to receive God's presence. Though you are created in God's image, you are not as God. You are not the source. You are a chip off the old block. God is omnipresent, omniscient, and God is the source from which all things originate. 
God is the beginning of all life. Therefore, if you want to live, you must find God. He's not lost. You are. So God finds us. But God is the source of your existence, and God is your helper. Especially when you do not know what you should be praying for, Romans 8, 26. God is your helper. God is the vine, and you are the branches. It will be by God's holy power, overflowing from within your inner spirit, bringing revelation through your mind that you will be renewed and conformed to think and pray perfectly. Say that one more time. It will be by his holy power, God's holy power, overflowing from within your inner spirit, bringing revelation to your mind, that you will be renewed and conformed to think and pray perfectly. Now we're talking about the third day of creation. Just as Noah stepped off the ark onto dry ground, the day will come when the excitement of your initial salvation and the spiritual waters you received from receiving the Holy Ghost begin to dry up. Your waters begin to recede. And you find yourself stepping out onto dry ground. At first, you may think the Lord is not pleased or you have done something wrong. But in essence, you have entered into day three. In Genesis chapter one, verses nine through 13, Genesis chapter one, verses nine through 13, the day, the third day of creation begins this way. So Genesis chapter one, verses nine through 13, the third day of creation begins this way. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Verse 10, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. After your spirit is born again in day one, and your mind is being renewed in day two, after your spirit is born again in day one and your minds are being renewed in day two, you have the ability to receive anointing from God's spirit above. As you are in Christ and he is in you, God's spirit dwelling with you, his waters or spirit combined with your waters or spirit because of the power of the Holy Spirit residing within you. It is then you will also begin to have discernment in your life, separating your water from your dry land. You separate yourself from that carnal nature, dividing and discerning those things in your life that are of the flesh and those that pertain to righteousness. Then you will see and discern right from wrong and choose to separate yourself from those earthly carnal things, things that are earthly, sensual, and devilish, James 3.15. Therefore, the earth represents our bodies, and especially what he did in the flesh before our salvation. There are still some old seeds remaining from the weeds still in the ground in our past, we walked after the lust of the flesh, but now, because we have God's discernment, we separate ourselves from the evil ways and from those old fleshly things to which we used to give attention to. We could choose to go back as a dog returns to its vomit, but we are not choosing to walk that way. We are no longer watering or giving life to that side of our natures. We have chosen God's life and have separated our wills to do those things that please God. The symbolism of water is the spirit. Water symbolizes the spirit. And just as there is no life without water, the spirit of God is necessary for life to be present. The word of God says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And all the churches that have not the Holy Ghost then there is no liberty in them. So the heart of man is the dwelling place of the spirit. 
though it is not the actual organ, but another definition for the word heart is the center. The Holy Spirit dwells in the center of our being, which is actually around the belly area, to be exact. If you look at the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 27, Proverbs 20, 27 says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. There it is. The belly area also represents the earth or the soil where spirit, the belly area also represents the earth or the soil where spiritual seeds are planted and watered, good or bad. If good seeds are planted in the heart of a person, their heart will produce good thoughts. But if bad seeds are sown there, the results will be an outward result of corruption and a crop of weeds. What the heart is full of is what the will of man will turn to. What the heart is full of is what the will of man will turn to. Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Luke 6, 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man or a foolish man out of the evil or foolish treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, foolish. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. The will of a person is a picture of what is in his or her heart. The will of a person is a picture of what is in his or her heart. Now, in day three, you begin to surrender your wills to the Lord. In day three, we surrender our wills to the Lord. And we give God our whole heart. It is a day of consecration and holiness. So when we give ourselves, our wills, to the things of God and deny our old fleshly habits, our old earth will begin to dry up. Our old earth will dry up. When you give yourself your will to the things of God and deny your old fleshly habits, your old earth will dry up. The implication here, implication here is that nothing is growing in the dry earth. If the seed is not watered, it will not come up. In day three, you are allowing all the weeds and bad vegetation to dry up before you replant and bring forth good seed unto God. God's word is the good fruit which will lead you into the works of righteousness. During dry seasons in your life, the Spirit of God will seem distant. This is because the Lord is allowing you to dry out, so to speak, and deal with your old nature. If he allowed a strong anointing to be with you during this season, you might assume that he was pleased with you as you are, then you would not press on in to change. And if you don't change, guess where you're going? And you'll lose whatever you had. But he allows you to struggle with your flesh for a time. Even Jesus, when in the wilderness, he wrestled with the beast as an example of how intense your struggle will be when you are resisting the old fleshly patterns and previous addictions. Also, in the third day of Jacob's life, the third day of Jacob's life, he struggled with the angel of God, the Lord. His hip being out of joint was to remind him that he was weak and always needed to put his dependency upon God. Though fasting and being alone with God in prayer, through fasting and being alone with God in intimate prayer, you can find lasting deliverance that will bring change to your life. Two verses to consider regarding day three are 1 Peter 3, 12. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those that do evil. And then we have James 5, 16. 
confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The fervent effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You see, James' encouragement and instruction to people is to call for the elders of the church, not just for healing, but also for healing of the soul, mind, will, and emotion. James encouraged us to find someone with whom we can trust to pray and intercede for our faults, praying one for another, James 5.16. A root of righteousness. Consider our Lord, in whom there was no sin. Now he grew up in a dry world. When Jesus was born, evil was rampant and there was little evidence of righteousness anywhere, especially in the synagogue among the scribes and Pharisees. To put it in today's perspective, there were no pastors to sit under, no spiritual counselors, no prayer lines to call, or spiritual friends to come into agreement with him. This statement gives us a glimpse of his plight and why at times he may have been exasperated at being the only spiritual person on the planet. The only spiritual Christian on the planet. To his own disciples, his own church, he said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, O oh, faithless and perverse church, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither unto me, and I'll show you how it's supposed to be done. Why couldn't we do it? Because of your lack of faith. And he's still saying the same damn thing to the church, to Christianity at large today. Matthew 17, 17. So when the disciples could not cast the devil out of a man's son that was asking for help, Jesus looked upon it as a very simple thing. He was God in an earth that was dry. John was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb, and Jesus said that John was the greatest of those born among women, yet he was least in the kingdom of God. He was locked into a type of day one ministry where no miraculous events of any kind ever took place, nor was any deliverance administered. Therefore, he was least because the kingdom had not yet fully come. John went ahead of Jesus, preaching repentance and water baptism, he was a type of day one, but Jesus was a type of day two. As he represented the Holy Spirit baptism, the second baptism that was yet to come. No one had the Spirit during Jesus' years on the earth except John. And after the death of John, Jesus was the only person in the world who had the Holy Spirit living inside of him, the only Holy Ghost filled believer. He was the only life in this earth. A root out of a dry ground. Isaiah 53, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2 says this about Jesus. For he shall grow up before him like a tender plant and like a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that you should desire him. Jesus had completely separated himself from flesh and from sin. Concerning sin, his flesh was a dry place, and Satan had nothing in him, and were called to be just like Christ, to follow after the same pattern. He was a root that grew up before God, <coughs> a tender plant that brought forth holiness, purity, righteousness, and salvation for the world. Planting in dry ground. You can also see that in Psalm 92, 12 to 15 as a reference. Talking about the planning of the Lord there in Psalm 92, 12 to 15. Now the first part of day three, the first part of day three is the separation of the waters and dry earth. First part of day three is the separation of the waters and dry earth. Yet in the second half of day three, the Lord is planting in the dry ground. If you have not noticed, all of the days of creation can literally be divided into two sides. You can also see this division in day three. You become the planting of the Lord only after you have learned to crucify your flesh. Once you learn to die to your carnal ways, then you can become useful to the Lord. You will be able to grow God's word in your heart 
and bring forth good fruit unto God. This is why the scripture says, The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. God's word is good seed, and it will bring forth after its kind. Verse 11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth vegetation, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Verse 12, And the earth brought forth vegetation, and herb yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Verse 13, And the evening and the morning were the third day. Death and resurrection of seeds. If you are in a youthful stage of your salvation and have allowed the weeds to grow wild in your life, the little measure of God's word that you do have and the revelation of it that you may have will be subject to die as it is choked out by all the weeds. Now, many people spend a whole lot of time thinking about many other things rather than God in their lives and spend a whole lot of time with their jobs and careers and, you know, watching TV and worldly entertainment and sports and favorite TV shows. Yet when they need God, he will not be able to help them. Yes, he will save all who call upon him, but it takes time to produce righteous fruit. The parable of the ten virgins makes this clear. All of those ten bridesmaids were saved, and they were all waiting for the Lord. In fact, the whole church was asleep. But at the midnight hour, a cry was heard, and all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Now the foolish virgins had not put oil in their lamps, so the flame had gone out. They no longer had the light of Christ. Therefore, they had lost their salvation. Their oil had gone out of their lamps, probably due to neglecting the word of God and not praying enough, or they were possibly caught up in the things of the world, which led to them neglecting the word and, 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 and uh, not praying enough. So when they, when they asked the other five virgins for some of their oil, probably hoping they could again light their lamps, the wise told them no least we not have enough for ourselves. Then they instructed the foolish virgins to go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Matthew 25, 9. Go ahead and get the revelation. Uh, now, this is what I want you to see. This is what I want you to clearly see and understand. I want you to have ears to hear, spiritual ears to hear, and spiritual eyes to see, and to see and hear clearly and understand. Matthew 25, verses 10 through 12. Matthew 25, verse 10 to 12. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Verse 11. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Lord, Lord, open to us. See, they were believers in the Lord. See, they were believers in the Lord. Verse 12, But God answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. These virgins who had oil were doing no wrong by not giving their oil away because the foolish ones could no longer see and hear. The light is our discernment. If you neglect your salvation to the point that your light goes out, and it's very easy to do, and a Christian doesn't even realize it. But the point is, if you neglect your salvation to the point that your light goes out, and the Bible says the majority of Christianity is foolish, and only a few there be that find it, only a few be wise. That is the whole entire theme of the Bible. Few that be that find it. Very few are actually wise, and a great many are actually foolish. But the light is our discernment. So if you neglect your salvation to the point that your light goes out, you have no direction. And where there is no vision, the people perish. Now the wise virgins could not be assured that if they gave them some of their oil, 
that they would be able to get their lamps lit again. It was obvious they were foolish. It was obvious they were foolish. True people of God are serious. They are not foolish, nor do they fool around. If someone wants you to fool around with them, or another term is just to hang out, they may be stealing your oil. Be careful, because if they have any oil, it is burning up quickly. These foolish virgins are the same people who are absorbed in the cares of this world and the pleasures of this life. Like weeds, they will choke the good seed. And I know that this is, it's not limited to what I'm about to tell you, but what I'm about to tell you is also included, like TV, sports, basketball, football, other things of this world. Time and a place for everything and the freedom to do everything, but not everything is expedient. Like TV, football, basketball, baseball, other things of this world that distract you from seeking God. And you watch TV, but you don't fast and pray. You don't praise and worship, and you don't read, study, and meditate on the Word of God. You don't have a strong foundation in that. And have those things continue to grow stronger and stronger every day. You know, do every Christian good to turn off the TV or not even have it. Now, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us exactly what the weeds are. In the account of Matthew chapter 13, the account of Matthew 13, 22, it says, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. The same scripture in Mark 4, 19 says it this way, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Then Luke chapter 8 and verse 14 says, And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, they go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection or maturity. These three verses all are only a little different, yet they each warn us about the attitudes and activities that choke the Word of God in our lives. Combined, they are the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, and the pleasures of life. And God is telling me, get rid of all of it. Anything that can distract, worldly entertainment, television, TV, worldly entertainment. I frown upon that because the Holy Spirit told me to. Watching TV and spend more hours every day watching TV and in less amount of time reading, studying, and meditating on the Word of God and fasting and praying and should be more time praising and worshiping from your soul, and more time fasting and praying, and more time reading, studying, and meditating on the Word of God, and less time doing this worldly entertainment, TV. What's wrong with y'all Christians? Get rid of all of the things that distract. These things are what the flesh loves to feed off of. These are the things that will hinder God from blessing your life getting mixed up and caught up in all these politics and ungodly language and looking down upon the Democrats or looking down upon the Republicans or where at what you know. No, get rid of all that crap. You can have your political point, your political view. You can, you know, but don't make a big deal out of it. And don't make a big deal out of politics. These things are what the flesh loves to feed off of. These are the things that will hinder God from blessing your life. Even when that one prays, 
it will not be very effectual producing results. If you have been praying and the heavens seem to be brass, you need to continue to repent and search for God in prayer by reading God's word and denying the lust of your flesh. Buy oil while there is still a little time. You must die to yourself. You must plant God's word in your heart and water those good seeds with prayer so the righteous seed can come forth. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doeth behold the upright. Psalms 11 verse 7. The rains will soon come. Here is a beautiful verse of scripture in Isaiah 55, 10 to 13, I think can be applied to the conclusion of a day three season. Verse 10, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Verse 11, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. If you have been diligent to hold on to God's promises, God's words will come to pass in your life. If not, they won't. When seeds are planted at first, you cannot see them. They are underground. But the Lord says that his words will accomplish and prosper his will, what he pleases in your life. The next two verses show the joy you're going to receive. Verse 12, For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in the singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The manifestation of God's word is worth waiting for. The manifestation of God's word is worth waiting for. Father God, I thank you for your word. Forever eternally established in heaven comes down and dwells among men in the earth. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening up our eyes to see all that you would have us to see and to hear and opening up our ears to hear all that you would have us to hear. For those that have eyes to see, let them see what the Spirit is showing the church and ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches regarding this pattern of sevens. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Until next time, folks. Love you.